Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, super excited to see all of your faces. I'm, we we're just talking about our disappointment that we weren't able to meet together, but I'm glad that we're all still here. So my name is Emily Keeler. I'm the Student Affairs Manager for the Herb Institute at the University of Michigan. And I'm joined by my colleague, Courtney Cook and Professor Sarah Soderstrom. So Courtney and I work together at the Herb Institute. Um, more about that in just a moment. And Sarah is our faculty director for our brand new undergraduate fellows program that we just launched. Um, she wears many hats at the university. She's also a professor in org studies. And so we're really excited to be here today. We just launched a brand new program for our undergraduate students. It's an interdisciplinary program um, targeted at those students who are really interested in exploring the nexus of business and sustainability. So um, Courtney, go ahead and maybe move to the next slide and we'll go over the agenda really quickly. Um, before we kick off, I'll give a little bit of introduction to who we are, what the Herb Institute is, um, how we ended up developing this program, and then we'll talk through some of the challenges that we had, um, how we designed programming this year, what were some of the needs of our students, and what resources were really integral to overcoming those challenges. Um, in addition, we'll pause a lot. We really want you to be able to take this time to take advantage of some of the <laughs> lessons that we've learned along the way. And as you're thinking about content that you plan to design within your own sustainability institutes or centers, um, we want to help you sort of build out a roadmap today. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to learn together and to have some really good dialogue. So. I'll invite everyone to use the chat feature. Courtney and Sarah and I will be monitoring it throughout the time. Um, and before we really dive in, I'd love to hear from all of you. Maybe you just want to pop in where you're joining us from and what you're hoping to learn about today. So I'll give a second just so that we can see who's in the room. Indiana, wish we were there. <laughs> I'm from India. From India, wonderful. Ontario, Sao Paulo. Oh, wonderful. So we've got folks from all over in the room. This is great. It's like a one per continent like bucket before anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got multiple here in North America. We're messing up the balance. <laughs> Great. And any anything that you are most excited about for this session or any anyone want to share why they ended up of all the things you could have chosen, <laughs> all the rooms you could have been in. For yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very good point. So uh, basically, I am going to design a program, a certificate program, and maybe an undergraduate program and doing either a master's program oh, in wonderful. sustainability. So I'm really looking forward to uh, understand the if you had a blueprint to do that, and of course, whatever you're putting in the content here, that's very interesting for me. Wonderful, great. And I see we've got a couple more faces that just joined us. Um, we're just getting started. We're talking about um, our goals for today's session. And so welcome to the folks who just joined. Feel free to pop in chat, let us know where you're coming from. Um, and again, my name is Emily Keeler. I'm the Student Affairs Manager for the Herb Institute. Um, I see a hand up, so go ahead. Hi, yes, yeah, so this is Matthew. Um, uh, just in terms of uh, our, our my specific interest, we, we are currently uh, refreshing and looking at both our undergrad and graduate programs. Um, we have a longstanding uh, sustainability certificate in our undergrad program. Um, which, which is uh, now 10% of our uh, undergrads take, uh, which, it, you know, it's gone from being a, a small boutique program to now a substantive proportion of our intake of, of undergrads is interested. And then we're also de developing a, a diploma in the, in the, in the postgrad program. So this is a very live and interesting conversation to be part of. Wonderful. All right. Well, to give everyone some context, um, Courtney, you want to go to the next slide for me? Um, so as I mentioned, Courtney and I are here with the Herb Institute. We're part of the student affairs team. To give you some context, the Herb Institute is a business and sustainability program 
at the University of Michigan. And so we just celebrated our 25th anniversary. So we've been around for a little while. Um, and the hallmark of our program has historically been working with graduate students. And so we're a partnership between the Ross School of Business and the School for Environment and Sustainability. Um, in addition to the teaching and education work that we do, we also are focused on thought leadership, business engagement. Um, and so we have a really broad reach. And so we work with partners both locally and domestically um, and globally on a, a variety of sustainability challenges. I think one of the things that's really set ourselves apart as a program is our really broad approach to sustainability. And so we're guided by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We have a focus on both environmental sustainability and also social sustainability. And so we have students that have come to us from a variety of backgrounds with a really wide breadth of career interests and impacts that they're hoping to make. Um, but as I mentioned, we've, we've been a program that has been geared towards the graduate experience. And so in my role and in Courtney's role as student affairs managers, we were starting to find that students were coming to us from the undergraduate level and literally knocking on our doors saying, we are really interested in the work that you're doing at the Herb Institute. Is there a space for me? Um, how do I find my way as an undergraduate into a career in this area? What resources are available? Um, in my position at Ross, I had the opportunity to lead a lot of undergraduate program experiences that were international, where we brought together folks from um, the Pite School, which is um, the program in the environment, and the business school. And these students were saying, we really, really wish we had content um, that was geared around us at, at the level that we're working in at the undergraduate. So I'll pause there and I'll let Sarah talk a little bit about her experience teaching undergrads and we'll lead into our next section. Thanks, Emily. Well, I think in parallel to hearing these needs uh, around, and actually, Courtney, I think we can just flip to the next slide so we can engage. Um, we were hearing challenges from our undergrad students in three different dimensions. And I'm sure many of you have seen this in your universities here at Michigan. I argue students often don't understand their power, and most things happen because of student activism and engagement. And this was bubbling up in a handful of different places. We had a net impact group for undergrads that launched separately from our graduate group. It recently won one of the undergraduate student chapter awards and was becoming more and more um, engaged and bridging across environmental and social components of sustainability with a footprint across not just the business school, but the broader university. We had a number of other student organizations around design and sustainability building, and we had a few aspects of curriculum starting. So I was teaching a lower level course that started with about 60 students and now consistently has over 200 to 300 students enrolled in it. And students were then saying, hey, where are the learning opportunities? that are facilitated by the university, right? We're here and we're driving a lot of this through our student organizations, through some of this programming, but how do we actually launch an undergraduate space around it? And so we were hearing this around, you know, within the classroom and beyond the classroom, but coupling it more formally so that each individual student wasn't trying to build their own path, but instead finding a path. Um, and how do they find other students who are interested in this space to learn from and engage with. And in particular, as they're thinking about navigating this as undergrads and seeing a very different, at least at University of Michigan recruiting space, um, how do they think about it from a career development perspective and charting their paths, both as they think about internships and, and research experience, but also around skill development. And so for us, that was a point where we paused and kind of the first prompt back to you as well is, you know, what are some of the needs that were most important for you to address as you're thinking about engaging and partnering with your students? Um, I fear Terry's question here around uh, any center focused on an aspect of sustainability. For us, the need really was a broad focus and a commitment to both the environmental and the social aspects. Um, but you could imagine something driving, if we were doing this today, climate is a pretty big focus here at Michigan, and would you drive something specifically around that? So it'd be interesting to hear some of your approaches to seeing what challenges you're facing. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone want to share how they're kind of grappling with some of these aspects of programming? I mean, we're our, at MIT, we, uh, everything we do has been for master's students um, so far. And there is an undergraduate major in management that exists. And there are some, you know, there's, we've danced around the idea of undergraduate programming. There are other parts of the Institute that are working on, there's, an, there's, a, an, there's a separate environmental solutions initiative that runs an environment minor. And so there's kind of a little bit of an undergrad crowd there, but I, um, I've just been, you know, I, I don't know how exactly how to get the spark going when it's not. So you talked about the students sort of or self-organizing around the Net Impact Club. Um, so I'm just thinking about in the absence of that, you know, what are some um, fire lighting things that could be done? Yeah, I can address that really briefly too, because I, while Net Impact, I think was one good center point, what mm -hmm. I was finding when I was talking to students was they didn't know that each other existed. And so I, I had the chance to go on this trip that was designed by another faculty member where it was a sustainability trip to Iceland where students were focused on energy and um, uh, clean energy. And so that group brought together um, both students that were in the Ross School of Business and then students that were engaged in this pipe program. And individually, they were all saying, I thought I was the only one. Uh -huh. And so that was a really big takeaway. Um, likewise, I had another chance to go on a trip um, where students were focused on sustainable strategy in India. And so this was a niche group that was self-selecting because they had this sustainability interest. But even yeah. despite that, they really felt like they were alone. And so for us, as we were building this program, it was a lot of effort on the ground to connect with the program advisors at each school to start figuring out what were the clubs beyond just net impact, um, where students were trying to find their people and just really do a lot of heavy um, advertising and marketing about this opportunity to get the word out. And so for us, it was great having Sarah because we could come into her class. <laughs> Um, and yeah. we even had the research, the student research team help design mm -hmm. um, and assess student needs. So that was the other, a couple other things that we had is I teach outside of the large class, I teach a project based course around sustainability in the campus and for two years mm -hmm. in a row, we had student teams of undergrads do their semester project around what would an undergraduate program look like what is the need for students and so they were running focus groups they were doing surveys and helping to build that business case mm -hmm. for what this looked like and in parallel to not um trivialize what emily was highlighting on is we really did and maybe courtney will i highlight this we'll trade off to emily starting to talk about the actual design aspect of this on the next slide but we were really pretty intentional about making this multidisciplinary and so a lot of things happen either in Ross or in our School for Environment and Sustainability or in our literature, science, and arts. And it was not an easy <laughs> challenge to overcome in navigating and ensuring. We had to have, I think, three different deans and four different associate deans yeah. sign off on the design for this program, right? Mm -hmm. So like, there was a lot of aspects for it. There's a reason it is not a minor because we couldn't navigate the structure around that. We had to ensure that seats were held in classes for people who weren't in different sc schools as we were driving it up. So, you know, I would say that we've launched this last year with our inaugural program, but it was two to three years of pretty heavy lifting before that, of really building up the institutional support for um, driving this. And I think Emily was gonna walk through a little bit of what that design actually looked like for us as we went into that. If it's not called a minor, what is, what's it called? Is it called a certificate or is it? Okay. We call it a fellows program. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but yeah, other, because at Michigan, everything has to have its own name, but for most universities, I think a certificate program would probably be where this would land. Yeah, but fellows is even easier, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so for us, it was really important to balance both the curricular and co-curricular learning. And so we're requiring that all students take 12 credits of pre-approved coursework. And so 
again, as Sarah was saying, depending on what school they're in, um, for example, if they're not in the business school, they may not be able to get a seat in some of the, the business classes. And so we needed to be able to pull from um, the Center for um, uh, Literature, Arts and Sciences, from the business school, from engineering, to be able to meet students where they were. And so we did a really extensive audit of all the courses where we thought the content mapped to our goals of the program. Um, and so students, we meet with them. Um, Courtney, and we'll talk a little bit about our peer advisor program that we've started too. And we help them sort of navigate how they can fit these courses into their curricular schedules. And so we've also done a lot of outreach with advisors at some of our key schools as well. And we also have a course substitution process. So if there's a course that's not listed, if it's a one-time offering, if there's an international opportunity, um, students can also propose that they get credit. Um, the program is open to rising sophomores or rising juniors. And so they apply during their sophomore year. So they have two years to get these 12 credits in, but they can count courses that they've taken um, earlier in their academic careers. Uh -huh. And so that was the curricular side. Um, again, it's only been a year. So there's been a lot of key learning in that space. Um, but the other thing that was really important for us was to develop these co-curricular learning opportunities. And so students are re required to attend a number of workshops throughout the year. Um, this year was also really interesting. In addition to launching a brand new program, Michigan was full virtual. And so trying to run a brand new program and also do it virtually was really interesting. We ended up doing a lot of webinars and it worked really well because we were able to pull in speakers that otherwise may not have been able to travel to the university. And so we had a range of folks come in um, we really tried to do everything from senior level sustainability practitioners to folks who were very early in their career. And so we were, the topic sort of ran the gamut of, you know, what does a day in the life look like? What are specific sustainability tools and skill sets that students need to have? How can they develop these in the workshops? And then what are examples of career pathways? And so we tried to have a really large breadth of training and learning opportunities for the students. Um, in addition, one of the things that we have really well established at the graduate level is opportunities for action based learning. And so we work really closely with our partners within our business network. They often will come to us and say, hey, we've got the sustainability challenge or opportunity and we'd love to have a student team working on it. And so we are able to integrate the undergraduates on some of these projects with graduate level students. Um, and we were able to provide funding and stipends for them to be able to do this work. And so that was another really valuable experience. And then finally, to round out the program, we talked a lot about the need for students to feel like they were part of a community. And so um, we worked really hard to design and deliver community events that fostered relationships among the students with their peers. And um, Courtney will talk a little bit more about the work that she did because she really drove a lot of the student programming that I think made this a really rich opportunity for students. Thank you, Emily. That was a great overview. So I want to jump in a little more specifics of the programming and what that was like for us, especially given it was a complete virtual year that changed a little bit of the scope. But these are certainly some highlights that really just helped us have a successful year that we wanted to share with all of you. So the first one is student leadership, and this looked in a couple of different ways for the fellows. Um, I don't know if we've mentioned, but right now we have about 70 students in the program split between junior and senior level. So we developed a student council, and that was one of the immediate things we did to start the program. And this was six students who just wanted to dive into a leadership program and helped us get the fellows program off the ground. And um, so we split, we have two co-presidents, we have um, different council members who help us with academics, with recruiting, um, with kind of career development, and then also just planning some fun community events. So that was a great way to get student investment right away and also have students leading the program. So it's a direct line of communication and feedback, honestly, from staff to students, which was really effective for us. Um, and then it's a way for students to build their development skills and leadership skills as well. We also developed a peer advisor program, which is another leadership position. So this in the future hopefully will grow. We just started with one peer advisor and this year we'll have two. So their main role is to help us kind of as that first stop when prospective students are interested in learning about the program. 
because the fellows program right now is just geared towards juniors and seniors, we're really planning to utilize the peer advisors to also reach those freshmen and sophomore students who have that interest in business and sustainability, but might not know what it looks like for a major or for a career or diving into community. So the, the peer advisors help us when we're limited in staff capacity to really reach out to new students and to just help meet their peers where they're at. Um, they've also helped a little bit with career visioning, providing different tips for what an internship and sustainability looks like, how to prep for a job, and some of those actual transferable skills. So the two student leadership pillars have been really helpful for us in terms of programming and just as a resource. Um, we also implemented check-ins with staff, which was especially helpful in a COVID virtual year, just so the students could feel like they have people well, you know, looking out for them and um, keeping their interests in mind, um, particularly as we kicked off the program and no one had met in person. Um, because the Urban Institute lies at that connection point between Ross and C's at Michigan, um, having dedicated staff to support students has been really, really helpful for us um, this year and into the future. And then that also turned into a community connections program. So as Emily mentioned, the Urban Institute has a history of 25 years, um, which also means we have a really strong alumni base of about 600 alumni. So we ran a um, community connections program this year. It was kind of an intro level mentoring where students, alumni and grad students as well could opt in. And we did random pairing of matches um, every month. And it varied anywhere from one to four matches. And this was a great way honestly, just for the Urban Institute as a whole to keep our community connected and engaged, and particularly to get the undergrad students integrated into our community that has been historically focused on the graduate population. Um, so that was really, really fun. And I think that added a lot of value to the undergrads just to learn from the alumni and from the grad students about what career pathways look like in sustainability, what kind of steps they can make, who they should connect with and whatnot. Um, so that was a really fun program. And then as Emily mentioned earlier, one of our focuses was also on action-based learning. So this takes a role of impact projects where in the past we've had some companies or different business partners approach us with a sustainability issue that they're hoping to tackle and they'd like students to work on that with them. So for us, it was also connecting undergrad students into those opportunities so they can get some of that hands-on action-based learning um, aside from an internship, but something that they could work on maybe five hours a week while they're also taking classes for a semester. And um, so those opportunities are really huge for us and a ton of students are interested in taking advantage of these. So it's something we're hoping to continue to grow. Um, also impact projects for the Herb Institute is supporting students in attending conferences or getting various trainings. Um, so also enabling and encouraging students to seek out those opportunities. Um, we found, particularly at the undergrad level, there's a lot of general interest and passion in sustainability, but there's a gap to kind of take that passion into a career. And so a lot of our role in our programming was helping students with that career visioning piece. Um, as Emily mentioned before, some of the webinars we brought in, also having workshops taught by our grad students to really get at the skills of communication and roles, prepping for internships, recruiting for sustainability jobs so on and so forth. So that's just a quick glimpse into programming and what it looks like. Um, so I know that the chat's going, but if you have any questions, we'd love to chat further about programming. Um, we also kind of wanted to take a minute. We talked a little bit about all of you and your needs for developing an undergrad program or building on your content and curriculum. So we were wondering if we could kind of start a dialogue of how could you fulfill some of those needs with programming what ideas do you have? What questions do you have? Um, love to kind of open it up to everyone else as well. Can I ask a quick question about the demographics of the crowd, like the gender balance, the um, racial balance, the um, national, like, like, you know, is it, does it, does it trend any particular direction is, as are you thinking about diversity? How, what does that look like? I would say we're thinking about it. Um, we're struggling, although similar to what we see at the University of Michigan, the business school and the environment program. So where we we have more women in the herb fellows than we have in the regular business school undergraduate space. Mm -hmm. So from a gender perspective, but that's comparable to what we see in our program in the environment. And is it like 50-50 or is it like 
majority think, women. I think it might be majority women last year, yeah. but not super majority. Okay. 67 maybe? 67, yeah. two thirds women? Uh, rough, yeah, but mm -hmm. something around that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm coming from org studies, which is like 80% women. So for me, I'm like, oh, wow, there are so many more There's men guys here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming from the business school, it's like, whoa, this is a completely <laughs> different gender dynamic. Um, we had, I think, similar international, or at least we had a number of students who were international for COVID, but I'd have to check on those numbers where we're struggling in general, and this is across the University of Michigan is around racial diversity. And so we're trying to think about ways of longer term partnering with University of Michigan Flint and University of Michigan Dearborn to bring in some courses where students can apply. We had our first transfer student applying last year, which is a nice mechanism for trying to bring in more non-traditional students um, and, and tapping into that. But we haven't had that reflection. We're not looking different than what we're seeing in program and in the environment in Ross, but we're just generally yeah, yeah, across four percent. We're like four percent black students at University of Michigan right now. Like it's a yeah. horrible, horrible reflection on diversity. So um, it is something we've been really thinking about for both the graduate and the undergraduate programs, uh, but we're continuing to grapple with that. And we are under a um, state constitutional level where we can't consider race or gender in any admission spaces. So we're also constrained in how we can engage with diversity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just had uh, just a couple of quick uh, sort of uh, uh, experiences to share from um, Ivy's um, Ivy side. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, um, we're, we're kind of the other way around. We, we started with an undergrad program and our current development focus is on the, 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 the postgrad work. Um, so we have a certificate program that we've had for about, about 10 years. And th there's a lot of similarities, um, which, is, which is great. Um, one of the things I wanted to share was um, we actually did a project recently where we went back and interviewed alumni that have pursued sustainability careers. Um, and there was a whole bunch of reasons why we explored that um, uh, because it's not a, a, a major focus of, 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 of uh, the business school career function. So this was people navigating their own way into sustainability careers. And many of them had been through the certificate program. And it was interesting. We asked them, you know, how did your ID experience equip you for that? And, and the thing that they said was most important was the community connections was was the fact that you know I'm not alone I, I'm not all these sort of <laughs> I'm I, you know there, there's sometimes people have a sense I'm all of these sort of greedy capitalists but proto capitalists but uh, no when they sort of came together and found you know uh, th these are people that are like me that have my interests and my passion you know I think that was uh, important not just for the learning experience but for giving them confidence in in pursuing um, careers in this in this area, sort of building on their business education. So that community connection aspect of the program seems to be, you know, sort of look, looking backwards, the, the, most, uh, the most important aspect of, of, of the learning experience. Uh, Matthew, just a clarification. So uh, when you say the community aspect, are you saying that uh, students found strength from their peer groups? or you were talking about their engagement with the local community? Yeah, sorry, uh, I should have been uh, clear on that with, the, with the, their peer group. Um, and the program basically works, it's, it's a set of courses that, that students um, need to select from. Um, so there's a curricular aspect, but probably the, the, the most important aspect is a series of events that are run through the year um, that generally have a theme per year. Um, so uh, 1919 was um, on um, Indigenous knowledge, bringing in Indigenous knowledge and reconciliation. Last year, it was a strong focus on, on purpose. Um, and so there's a series of events around that um, that bring in speakers um, that, you know, have uh, a, a sort of intensive sort of peer discussions. So it's those events that are the sort of tools for that, for that community building and, 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 and bringing the students together. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a really great um, point. 
as we think about where these students fit within the context of an alumni network. And so that actually is one of the challenges I didn't put out on the slides, but it's something that we've thought a lot about because at the Herb Institute, we have about 700 alumni. And very similarly, we do surveys every year and they always come back and say, the number one benefit was being part of this community, being part of this network. And so as we think about what do we now, how do we integrate these undergraduates who have significantly less experience into the fold with really well seasoned practitioners. And so I, over time, I, you know, they'll kind of level up together. But I think within the first couple of years, it's going to be a really interesting experiment for us to fold this whole new group into a really well established and really rich alumni culture. Well, and I, I mean, I think we should be honest, too, in that we've seen some pain points with that just in the past year with our current MBA MS students and saying, hey, are the undergrads sucking up all of the attention? Are they taking all of this energy? Like, where are we in this? And so there's definitely been a process of navigating our own communities in both trying to figure out when do we build ties between them, but when do we need to attend to each distinctly with their needs and their focus and ensuring that we're not um, just, you know, in, ensuring that we're getting the benefits from both and not watering it down and losing those strengths. So for coming from having a strong undergraduate program, you're in the opposite, but having that balance can be tenuous at times. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, and and I, I don't think you can sort of pre-design that. I think it's only going to come through experience and sort of learning to sort of calibrate between the, the two levels. Yeah. And one of the benefits, I think, with both of these, our MBA program is three years, our undergrad program is two years. Like, you have a pretty fast time where things just become the norm. So for this cohort of MBAs and MS, they're like, well, wait, you're asking us to run workshops for the incoming cohort they're like oh it would be great to be able to get experience running some workshops and so it just becomes part of what they are with that the benefits and the curse of the turnaround as well of these students yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, just one very specific question with with this certificate program th does this appear on students academic transcripts no um and so we went back and forth we and I would say that this has been a University of Michigan um, bureaucratic thing. So we've been going through an issue at Michigan where way above any of this, people have been saying we want fewer things on transcripts and not more. So we had had for years, one of the programs this was that we looked at internally was through our Graham Institute for Sustainability, which is an interdisciplinary, more research focused program at U of M, and they had had an undergraduate program that had had things on the transcript. They were told you can't do this anymore. Now that's been pulled off. So to have tried to get it on the transcript here was just going to be a no-go. And so part of that is where now we're building out other ways for students to ensure that they can get the legitimacy that shows from the transcript. So what do we build out on the website so students can be you know, highlighting I was part of this and share a link and people can see that they legitimately went through all of this. We do provide a certificate. We're also, you know, Emily highlighted in chat trying to make the herb on the roads a reward for finishing everything at the end of the program. So there's a big thing that you get so that we have both the social and the kind of professional validation that this happened. But um, with our current administration, it just wasn't going to get on the transcript. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's good to know. Yeah, that's kind of the battle we're fighting. Uh, fighting. That's a bit strong with the 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 graduate uh, diploma. Um, um, and, and, but for, you know, I, I my sense is for the undergrads that that doesn't matter as much. But I think um, the at at the uh, the post grad level having the formalization seems to be something that's more important. So Emily, do our graduate students get this on their transcript? They just get the two dual degrees, correct? Uh, correct. And then we work with them on how to put it on their resumes. But yeah, they're so even at our graduate level, which is now you know twenty plus years, we don't have this Herb Institute noted on their transcript at all. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I mean, the, the, the dual degree thing is already. Kind of that about uh, LinkedIn mechanisms and LinkedIn certificates. And so that's yeah. a, um, one option that we're seeing others have used. Thanks, Sarah, Sarah and Terry. Yeah. I'm going to jump to the next slide to talk about critical resources. I think we've touched on some of these, but don't want to lose sight of others. Yeah, so it, I think it can be, it's, we did, as I had mentioned earlier, just launched this in the past year, but it's been years in the making. Um, I think when Joe Arbai, who has now left U of M, first came in as director, this was one of the things that he really wanted to tackle and became an ongoing project. And so we want to recognize the, the privilege that we have in coming into building this out because of the herb network. Um, we have had a number of alumni who were involved in shaping what this could look like, of participants um, who have come from the different spaces and come back and engaged, particularly in the programming. And so that has been huge. And particularly in this remote year, I know Courtney mentioned this from the programming perspective, but having the alumni come in and spend an hour with six to eight students really in an engaged discussion around what their career looks like, what their path was, how you built this out has been um, invaluable. And it's one of the things that I think we learned in the remote year that we would have avoided in a regular year because we would have been prioritizing in person and we recognize the power of that and we'll kind of continue uh, with this. So one silver lining of having to have been remote is we saw the power of this herb network even more. Um, and we did have support from departments across campus. I had noted in chat, but undergraduate advisors are worth like three times their weight in gold, four times, they're amazing. And so their insight into what courses are there, who are gonna be supporters, what um, students to recruit and how to build this out was critical, particularly with our commitment to try to make this a program that is roughly half business school students and half non-business school students. So we really wanted that interdisciplinary space. And so we couldn't depend on any one group in kind of building that out and thinking it through. Um, we used a lot of research in a handful of different ways. I mentioned a couple of the projects that we used in the years uh, previous in developing the content and thinking about the design for the program, focus groups with students, surveys of students, thinking about um, what some of their key needs were and what would engage them to go into a 12 credit commitment their junior and senior year that didn't come with any monetary, you know, we, we're not paying them. It's not on their transcript. So the benefits really are coming from what they're getting out of that curriculum, but the community that we'd highlighted, that Matthew had highlighted in that space of engagement with this broader network. Um, and we are very lucky to have the funding from the Herb Foundation in particular that helps to support things like Herb on the Road that we had talked about. It wasn't funding that we needed to go out and get new. It was embedded within our structures already and we had staff in place. Um, I will say we benefited significantly from tapping into the undergrads as kind of their own part of our staff <laughs> in helping with the workload and building that out. But I think really considering those resources that you need, and I can imagine in many other places, the funding would be much more of a barrier than it was for us, for example, um, and, and thinking about how you would kind of navigate those aspects. I just wanted to, again, pause and see what questions people have. Sarah, uh, do you have any slides on content? Like, how do you decide on the content? How did you decide on the content? I could share out if you want to, I can put in my um, link. We have the research structures that we used um, for some of those aspects. So we have policies, we have a huge 
handbook in place that we have for ourselves. We have the handbook that goes to the students around what the program looks like, but we do also have the outcomes from some of the um, early research around what the students asked, what focus groups they had, what types of questions they included in the survey. And so I'd be happy to share some of those resources as well as um, helpful for people in navigating that. Um, I will sure. well, preface, you know, it's navigated in, in different ways, some better than others, but over time, I think it really kind of built to that. Um, uh, actually, my uh, question, Sarah, was basically, uh, you have a master's program, you have an undergraduate program, and you have a certificate program. So from a, you know, pedagogical or content point of view, uh, is there a way you design the difference? Or it was just a more diluted form of what you teach in masters? Oh, so in the actual classroom. Um, so it's interesting because we've had, so part of what we've had here too now is a couple new classes launch at the undergrad level because we're showing this demand. So now um, Andy Hoffman has his course that he teaches for the MBAs and he's also teaching some for undergrads. And we went through a debate and his syllabus looks almost exactly the same for his undergraduate courses from his graduate course. Now the students are coming in with a different background. So they're not bringing a work experience to push that. They're, I think, a little bit more maybe deferential than what we're seeing in some of our graduate students. Uh, but I, he and I, between our two classes align, we cover the same class cases that we use in our MBA courses. Um, we have many of the same assignments, even with my class that is first and second year. So 18 and 19 year old students. I have found one case in 10 years of teaching that was too complicated for the undergrads, but that worked for the graduate students and every other one we've used in different ways. Now I provide more background for my undergrads. I they actually engage more with some of the theoretical readings, right? Um, and, and those different components to it. And so I have found the course design is actually quite similar. It's navigating the in-class discussion where I feel the difference between the graduate and the undergraduate kind of aspects. Um, and, and then it's just really interesting. Like some of the projects for the undergrads are much stronger than the graduate students because I think they still dive in a bit more to that and yeah. they have less. Anyways, it's an interesting tension, but I don't find it's a new curricular design. I do find that the students are asking for, we have, we need more variety for our undergrads than we often need for our graduate students. And so we found in the first year of this program, for the undergrad fellows program, we had a relatively small list of classes and we were being pretty strict around a class counts towards the 12 credits if it has both a business and a sustainability component. And we've become much more um, flexible with that. So we've started bucketing the classes into areas. So we have one that's a little bit more of an energy space. So if you want it, here are some of the core courses that we recommend. And then if you're interested in energy, here's a group of classes that would work. If you're interested in uh, climate, you know, just this, uh, there's a bunch of food courses that Michigan offers. So we're having these spaces where we're building out the curriculum in a little bit more of a menu approach for the undergrads, where we're helping them navigate this in a broad way. And also starting to do the lens of where are the courses that we still need something to be taught that might inform where we hire, how we think about bringing in, and we're seeing that across both the graduate and the undergraduate. People are clamoring for more classes in both spaces, and we just simply don't have the faculty to teach as much as they are asking for. Thank you. Um, I would also add that we address some of these challenges through the co-curricular programming too. And so when it comes to designing and delivering projects for students, um, it's really figuring out what the needs are of our partners and do we have students that match the skill sets. And so there's some projects that just, they're really intended for somebody that's coming in at that graduate level, but then there are a lot of opportunities that we found um, were under, like Sarah said, with 
the courses undergraduates deliver almost better sometimes because they're so eager to dive in and they might have more time to, um, to dedicate. And so for Courtney and I, a lot of that is sort of scoping and figuring out what the needs are of the partners and how do they map to the skill sets that our students have. And we've had some interesting experiences where we've been able to put both grads and undergrads together too, to foster some of that learning. Well, I have Sarah, a question. I see your question in chat. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sarah, please go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, I saw Sarah's question in chat a little bit about the compulsory versus uh, opt in. And we have for both of our graduate and undergraduate programs at Herb, it's an opt in kind of approach. So for our graduate, you have to be accepted to both the business school and the School for Environment and Sustainability. And if so, then you're in for the undergrads they apply as sophomores and then they're in and even at that point they opt into which classes they take and how they navigate it now at the same time we're having ongoing conversations in the business school around how do we integrate more into the curriculum and can we get things in core courses and but we have taken that as two kind of distinct strategies so one a broader you know college curricular component and one are community programming and, and groups from that way. Um, I do think having the communities puts less pressure in some ways, there's that paradise, right? Having the community so that the students feel like they're getting what they need puts less pressure on the university for some of the broader curricular embedding because students are getting their needs met through these communities. So there is that um, trade-off, but that that has been the approach that we've taken. Sarah, just quickly on that, um, an area where actually it's it's useful is uh, that we've found is the enrollment in the certificate program. Um, so it, when it started out, it was 15, 20 students of a cohort of 600. And it just in the last few years, it's just taken off. So we're now at 70 uh, students enrolled for this coming year. Um, and that narrative around the explosion of interest in sustainability gives uh, ammunition to going back to that, well, where else do we need to have it in the, you know, in the, the core curriculum? So it's a very useful um, <laughs> a data point for, 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 for arming those conversations and taking them from the qualitative to the specific. Yes, and we've seen too that the new classes that we've added, so Andy Hoffman and Tom Lyon have both added undergraduate courses, Ted London has been teaching an undergraduate course, they all have huge wait lists, right, these are classes that fill right away, Andy's class is like Monday, Wednesday at 830 in the morning, no seniors want to be up at 830 in the morning, and it fills before juniors even get to registering, so we see that kind of aspect. Uh, Fernanda, I see you have a question? Yes, uh, a, a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, no, it's, it, it was very interesting to listen to all of you uh, here at our business school. Uh, I run a, a course on sustainability that is based on transdisciplinarity. And it's a course that is already 10 years old. And we have a community uh, of more than 450 students that are connected with us along all those years. And it's a very powerful community. They, they help each other. They are always in touch with us. And, and it's very interesting. But uh, this course is not a mandatory course. Mm -hmm. And this, this question for me, it, it strikes me a lot. Because um, in one hand, um, uh, we we, we did this enchantment on the, the course. So we also have a waiting list, a giant waiting list, uh, because we, we just take 20 to 22 students per semester, and we have uh, a, a, a lot of demand on it. So there is this enchantment, and that's great. But at the same time, uh, I believe we are, we are living in a, a such a, urgent uh, time uh, there's no time to waste you know climate change is uh, already part of our daily lives uh, 
I don't know who, who there is in Canada, but I'm seeing the news. They're super hot in, in Canada. And so this mandatory versus um, uh, not mandatory strikes me a lot. You know, uh, in our business school, undergrads don't have, for instance, uh, mandatory courses on sustainability, no matter what the subject, they don't have it all. So you can be a, a management, um, a manager without having no sustainability at all in a four year undergraduate program. For me, this is an unbearable. I, I can't believe this is going on. So, so this is a, something that strikes me, you know? Uh, yeah, just yeah. sharing my thoughts. <laughs> No, I mean, I think it's a, I appreciate you sharing and hearing about how this is pervasive across. We're seeing, I think Sarah in chat added some commentary around Edinburgh around their approaches for, you know, introducing absolutely every student. And what I would say at Michigan and what I'm hearing from you, Fernanda, and your school is that the introduction isn't necessarily even happening, let alone yet having sometimes these spaces for inspiration and for greater ingraining, right? And so how do we think about balancing that becomes a challenge. What we were hearing with Emily and Courtney and I at the herb was a students who were introduced more luck of the draw maybe, but then wanting that inspiration and ingrainment, if we're gonna use Sarah's language, I, and so, the, and that was where we came in. Our ideas around introducing is a space that we still need to work on. Splashes. Yeah, so just to first of all, uh, quickly respond to Fernanda. I think uh, it's the situation is so different in developing countries. It's sometimes, you know, even you would hesitate to start talking about it. Like you said, you know, the undergraduate students or MBAs having no single course in sustainability. But this was a question to the presenting team here. <clears throat> so I'm uh, starting a project where we don't have a legacy of Ivy or Herb or Michigan and multiple connections and no thinking about funding. So this is a university where sustainability is getting started for the first time. And as I said, they are going to start with certificate and an undergraduate and then a postgraduate. So uh, given your exposure to student issues, operations and acad you know, academic issues, what would be one thing you know, we should do and what is one thing we should be careful about? I have one, my, my first thought is be careful with how much you bite off at once. I think that, um, in, I mean, we're very lucky to have staff, but Courtney and I are, we're the student affairs team. And so anything that touches the student experience with grads and undergrads from recruiting to admissions, to alumni work, to all the backend administration, um, it's us. And then, to, so to design and deliver a program, I think we were very intentional about putting everything um, into writing and creating some really um, strong structures that we could look back on and to be able to stay really organized. And I think there is, there's so much that you can do with sustainability that if you don't have some organization on the back end, it can get out of control very quickly. Um, and so I think figuring out a structure that makes the most sense and- um, what, what, Emily, what do you call the document? You said that we figured uh, it out. So we, have, uh, we actually have a, I don't know if you can see it. This is a program design and process guide that we put together. And so as we were designing this program, we thought about what is our statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion? How are we going to live by that? Um, what is the process for recruiting students? Um, how will we review them? How are we going to wait um, as we make those admissions decisions? How do we keep the records? Um, what are, how many required events are students being asked to attend? And then from there, working backwards to build out a calendar. And so this is like the really not exciting answer, but I think if you're coming up and you're doing something new and you're limited in terms of bandwidth and staff power, it's going to be really important to be intentional about trying to do one or two things really well. And um, I've been at Herb now for coming up on five years. And this is something that I struggle with because as an institute, we have this broad reach and we're, we say yes to a lot of things. And so I think we're always challenging each other to really put some structure and some parameters on the work that we're doing so that we can do it well. So that's a really not exciting answer, but I feel like it's so important. That I, Thank I, you. I, Thank you. I would say, um, 
would just add sorry, that really sorry, quickly. I, I, oh. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm just, I just have to, have to make you aware of the time. We have just three minutes for the next uh, point, which is uh, networking. Um, so in, in, in 4.30, we start with the networking program. So just, just for you to know, maybe you can wrap up, uh, Courtney, say, or yeah. Sure. I can be really quick. I just wanted to add, yeah. just getting started, the students have been so valuable in our launching of the program this first year. And the peer advisors are paid hourly for their work, but the student council is just a voluntary commitment. And I think those students are willing to put in the work if they feel like they're reaping some of the benefit and they're getting the community, they're getting the curriculum and they're getting the extra added value of the workshops and co-curricular. So I just wouldn't underestimate the power of that if you can work with students to launch some of these things and get their initial feedback. They're oftentimes very, very invested and willing to help as much as they can. Okay, sorry, I don't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to break into the session like this. I mean, please, just if you want to say something at the end uh, to finish the session, uh, just please, please uh, do. Uh, if not, um, just to to remind you, because I, I'm receiving messages from the organizing team, to remind you uh, to go back to the to the main to the Skooks platform, and there to enter into the. This is another, this will be another room uh, where you will be sent out to the breakout rooms with the, for the networking and they will explain to us what we have to do. But please remain because this is also going to be very, very exciting and, and important. So, yeah. I mean, I just have one final wrap up thought. Yes, please. If you're here, community came up over and over and over. And I think it's so important for all of us to remember this too, that we are not alone in this and that you know, just being at this conference and hearing the questions and concerns and ideas and thoughts, lean on everyone that you can. I think there's so many people that want to see programs like this succeed. And, um, you know, you're, you're not alone in building up something. You have resources and there's other folks that are trying to do the same thing. So the more that we can lean on each other, um, I think that's really key. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Really nice session. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Fabulous. Thanks Bye. to the Michigan folks. That was